First of all, um, so recording has started. My name is Hunada. I'm very humbled to be moderating the session today. And I want to start by thanking you, Professor Norman. We are honored to host you. Um, and I know you just finished a long interview, so um, I will do a quick introduction. And hopefully in that time, you, you'll get to have a space to catch your breath. Um, I would also first start I would be thanking you all or our audience joining us online and a special thank you to Mosaic Center, which we see in the camera uh, in Berlin for hosting the live screening of the session. Mosaic is um, Mosaic or Al-Quds Library is a Palestinian owned and run library and community center that regularly organizes interesting events. Um, a massive thanks also to Respond Crisis Translation for their sponsorship of our series. Respond is a global collective of language activists mobilizing in support of refugees and asylum seekers um, and was co-founded by one of our members. Uh, they have been doing a ton of Palestinian solidarity work, both for Palestinians seeking asylum in other countries, as well as for protests and mobilization movements in Palestine, Israel, and across the US and Europe. They are super grassroots organization. So if, if you're interested in supporting their work as an activist translator or with a donation, your support would go a long way. In today's session, we will start with a quick introduction about our group and then about Professor Norman. After that, we will have a dialogue with the professor followed by Q and A with the questions from the audience, both online and in the center. Uh, this is our agenda for today, so let's get started. This lecture is co-organized by Student Coalition Berlin and Decolonial Research Group at Humboldt University of Berlin. We are a group of students from all different disciplines at HU and Free University of Berlin. We're both deeply concerned about the unfolding events in Palestine, Israel, and the ongoing discourse and knowledge production about the topic in Germany, or the lack of it for that matter. Moving on to a quick introduction about Professor Norman, although I know, I think everybody knows him. Uh, so Norman, sorry? You can skip the introduction. People know me or- uh, You are, don't... yes. People do know you, but I think there is one segment that I read recently, which I found quite interesting. Um, but just calling you uh, America's most de divisive Israel-Palestine scholar, um, which is probably true, look, looking at the academic scene. Um, so I will skip the introduction to get to the um, just two important facts. His most recent book, I'll Burn That Bridge When I Get To It, was released last year. But his book, Gaza, an inquest into its martyrdom, is number one on Amazon's Middle East bestsellers book. So now we can move to our questions. Um, in our questions, we wanted to focus on hearing from you, Professor Norman, on the context of Germany's support to Israel's, Israel politically. And then we want to move on having critical look at the position of the Western academia. Could we start first from the complex geopolitical landscape surrounding the ongoing escalating genocide in Gaza and how, no matter what happens, the West, especially Germany, um, continues its unwavering support for Israel. In your book, The Holocaust Industry, you speak about the, the Holocaust memory being instrumentalized to justify the existence of the apartheid state of Israel, which to say the least is extremely contentious and frankly triggering to many people. So against this background and looking at Western position, could you tell us more about the journey that brought you to this conclusion in the book? <clears throat> the, the book is in, um, it's really focused on an American audience. It doesn't have Germany in mind. And it's not at all about the Nazi Holocaust. Nazi Holocaust is a vast uh, scholarship on the subject. And most of the scholarship, most of the substantial scholarship is done by Germans nowadays. Uh, the American historians were basically propagandists uh, during the period where the Holocaust was being used as a political and also a financial weapon. 
And the production in the American context was very shoddy. It was not a uh, serious scholarship. Of course, there are exceptions. The greatest to star in the Nazi Holocaust uh, by a wide margin is uh, was Raoul Hilberg. Uh, but Hilberg began his career long before the Holocaust became an industry. Or well, once it became an industry, the quality of the scholarship uh, was very uh, 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 was uh, very low quality, and uh, at a certain point, the major historians in the subject became Germans. So, my book wasn't really about that whole German scene. First of all, I barely read German. I studied it for a period and knew it, but have completely forgotten it totally. Um, so I'm not really talking about the German scene. The German scene, and on a moral level, it is complicated. And I don't pretend to uh, deny the difficulties that decent Germans might have on this subject. Uh, I imagine if I were German, I would have, I would have been filled with doubts and reservations about just how to go about uh, inserting oneself in this debate. I, I'm not going to deny that. Uh, what I find repellent in the Germans is you always have the option of saying nothing. You could, you know, you, you don't have to do what the Germans have been doing with this 100% the backing of Israel in the name of a historical responsibility. You could always have been low key in your interventions. But this kind of brazen, flagrant support of Israel as a genocide is unfolding, it's just so revolting that whenever I, I see these Germans, I'm just filled with loathing, in particular the Nazi princess Ursula van der Leyen. Uh, she's a typical Aryan Ubermensch type, the blonde hair and the uh, this kind of lean muscular physique. You can easily, easily see her. I mean, whenever I see her, I think of a, the commandant in the, in, the, in the women's barracks of a concentration camp. It's so easy to see her that way with the crisp Aryan uniform, oh, walking through the camp with a whip in one hand and a German shepherd at her other side. She's a typical, the Aryan Ubermensch type. Uh, so she fills me with loathing. Then there are people like um, Habermas, the great philosopher, who uh, in 2006, oh no, no, that, that was Joschka Fischer. Joschka Fischer in 2006 was defending Israel during its uh, massive assault on Lebanon. Uh, Habermas, he was the one that presented uh, Daniel Goldhagen with the De German Democracy Award. These people are, they're so, uh, they're such revolting personalities. You could say, okay, I'm German, I'm torn, and then just don't do anything. Okay, I can get that. But this upfront, brazen, flagrant support of Israel, no, that's a bridge too far for me. So I, I've always said I, I recognize the difficulty of a non-Jew in Germany navigating these moral waters of the state of Israel. But it didn't have to be done this way. I actually don't believe, incidentally, I could be wrong. I don't think Angela Merkel would have been as terrible as Schultz. But I, I can't say that for certain. Um, I think since you already started um, 
with the we shifted a little bit to the academic scene. I think it's good to go there. I I've mentioned briefly in the in the email um, that we have tried to screen this session and other ones for that matter and at our universities, um, and it didn't work. Our requests were denied. But meanwhile, our universities are hosting uh, uh, speakers who are going to just repeat the different Israeli narratives. One of the speakers in Cologne University was the ambassador of Israel. So in that light, um, and I think you've mentioned a lot in your interviews and in looking back at your experience, this term, the academic freedom of expression. And it seems painfully obvious to us as a students from multiple institutions and fields um, that Western academia has the responsibility not only to platform Palestinian scholars and academics to provide urgently needed historical context, but also to create research and visiting scholar roles for Gaza, for Gazan scholars and academics. In your perception, how do you define the uh, freedom of expression? And what do you think the role of Western academia is in these times? Um, bearing in mind our current experience um, in being restricted and which made us create this whole lecture series to create a, a new narrative that is not controlled by, um, by the academia in this state. And I also wanna add something um, that was noted to me that the difference between American and European, especially Germany, that the German uh, universities are funded by state. My understanding is that American universities are not funded by state. No, there's no way to generalize about American universities. There are private universities, and then there are public universities, uh, state universities, city universities, which are financed by the public. Uh, so you can generalize across the board in terms of the funding of the universities and also the laws by which they're bound. Private institutions are bound by very different speech laws than public institutions. So it's hard to generalize there also. The basic fact is, at least in theory, at least in theory, uh, the U.S. has a pretty... Uh, strong civil liberties tradition when it comes to speech. And I personally did not benefit from it. I wasn't able to get a job in the universities, but most people have been able with their political convictions, which can be on the left, on the far left, can be pro-Palestinian as it's called, they've been able to get jobs. The university has been, on the whole, pretty tolerant, but it has changed a lot since October 7th. Uh, there's been a wholesale uh, in, in intervention by the billionaire class uh, to try to stifle speech, on, uh, speech uh, supportive of the people of Gaza, to stifle them on campus, and they've engaged, they've engaged in tactics which are unprecedented in American history. They've removed two presidents of two elite universities from their office. They've toppled them. That's never happened. N nothing ever came close to that happening. Uh, so I would say the uh, what's called academic freedom in the United States since October 7th has been very seriously jeopardized. I have no doubt about that. Uh, and I suspect there's going to be a backlash now. Already Columbia University professors have been organizing to undo the decisions that were made after October 7th by the administration. The administration banned groups which are supportive of Palestinians. They even banned, I find it kind of funny, in the name of fighting anti-Semitism, they banned the Jewish Voices for Peace. And there's not even the self-awareness that, well, maybe there's something a little bit wrong here. Uh, no concept. They're just taking orders from the donors. These are private universities, and they're very heavily in, uh, uh, heavily dependent upon the, do the donor class, the people who give money, usually mostly alumni. 
And uh, the alumni have made clear, unless you suppress pro, what's called pro-Palestinian speech on campus, we are not going to give you money. And the money is significant. You know, these people are the super rich, the billionaire class. We're talking about $100 million at a shot. That's not small change. Yes. I would say that since October 7th, uh, academic freedom has come under very serious assault uh, in the United States, mostly by the Jewish billionaire class, but also right wing people. Yeah, yes, but I think um, in in the German case, why we were, I think it's not completely surprising that we are being restricted, um, but the fact that uh, it's. I think what started with Germany's current st stance on the South Africa's case uh, in, in the International Court of Justice was also reflected straight on the, the academia being supported by, uh, by the state. So that position was reflected also on us. So Germany is going to support in every position possible this this current situation. But how do you... How do you read it politically? Like, uh, how and how could is there any chance for this position to change or shift in any direction? Very hard to say because at the end of the day, it's about German public opinion. And if Germans are, for various reasons, fearful about speaking their real opinions, then is going to be very hard to get any kind of political change in German culture. It really has to start with uh, Germans, young people, political activists, formulating the correct strategy about how you overcome, whether you want to call it Holocaust guilt, Holocaust manipulation, uh, but also it's an aspect of German history that can't be ignored. And how you, as I say, how you navigate these very morally uh, complicated waters. So I think what needs to be done first is for people, young uh, activists, young people, to think through a, a strategy because the strategy has to uh, take account of there are real historical facts that can't be ignored. They are a part of modern German history. Uh, and so there is a kind of moral responsibility to the past. That's one set of facts. And then the other set of facts is the Holocaust memory is being manipulated and exploited for political gain, um, that a lot of Germans are torn about how to relate to Israel because the Holocaust is being used to manipulate their feelings and fill them with guilt. Um, and Israel is committing crimes of a very high magnitude, including what's called the crime of crimes, the crime of genocide. And it's using the manipulation and exploitation of the memory of the Nazi Holocaust in order to stifle criticism of those crimes. So there are arguments on both sides. And then you have to carve out a path that respects the arguments I first expressed and also condemns the arguments I subsequently expressed. There is a German past. The Nazi Holocaust figured prominently in its recent past. And there is a moral responsibility on the shoulders of Germans. The Holocaust is being exploited 
it's a, being exploited by playing on feelings of guilt, and it's being used to uh, stifle criticism of Israel. And then the strategy is how, how do you make your way through that? I, I, I've said I don't think it's easy. I, 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 would, I would say the first step would have to be to work very hard on a statement that lays out your position as you try to navigate these waters. You have to work on a in what used to be called a mission statement. Yeah. You know, what, what do you, how do you weigh all these factors? How do you, how do you do it? And I, I think that's, in my opinion, that's the first exercise for you as a group to talk it out here, specialists of all sorts, you know, have a series of forums, um, Um, Professor, we already actually, there are lots of these things we're looking at, but when we look at the German case, uh, do you think, while, while obviously the German guilt and the relationship with between Germany's connection to Israel and what has happened in the past is, is, is very strong and clear, but wouldn't be there also other factors um, that explains Germany's case. What about the rest of Europe? What about countries that were not um, as involved? What about the United States position? Um, wouldn't there be? Wouldn't be also fair to look at other aspects uh, that contribute? Yeah, there, there are other aspects because there's uh, what's called a major Muslim problem in Europe, and that colors a lot of the perceptions about the Israel-Palestine conflict. It's not just about guilt. It's about uh, Europe not uh, being hospitable to Arabs and Muslims. And so there, that lack of hospitality then projects itself onto the people of Gaza. So that's another significant factor. And then there's a third factor, which is, like it or not, Israel is seen as a protector, not just of U.S., but of Western interests in the Middle East. And they do not want Israel's uh, military power to be diminished. So it's not just feelings for Jews, it's Israel is a regional surrogate of US power. And it's also a regional surrogate of EU power. And then there's the other factor. So, so far we have the Holocaust issue. We have the Muslim issue. We have the geopolitical issue. And then we have a fourth issue. Israel is a far right state. And there are many far-right governments in Europe right now, and very far, many far-right political parties now. And they see Israel as being a kind of, ironically, they see it as a Aryan state. Now, I know that's ironic, given that it's a Jewish state, but they see it as a, 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 a uh, Aryan state, the another uber-mentioned state, and they see the Arabs, the Palestinians as intervention, you know, subhumans. And you see that with van der Leyen. You see she feels very comfortable around Israelis, the supermen, and the loathing for the Arabs, the Palestinians, but Arabs in general. So there is that uh, the fact that Israel is a far-right state, and there are many, there are far-right governments, far, you know, in Hungary, uh, but there are also far-right political parties which are on the verge of taking power. In place in Netherlands, in Hungary. So I agree with you that it's not just the Holocaust issue. There's, it's a convergence of 
many issues. Um, and maybe even the Holocaust issue is diminishing as compared to the Muslim issue and the far right issue. It may actually be diminishing in terms of its relative importance in trying to understand uh, Germany today. I I want to go into uh, I want to stay in the same area of why is is it hard to to fight from within Europe against this one sided narrative, which is the restrictions and control again. Um, and I want to go to the one of the biggest, um, uh, one of the most controversial words now, which is Hamas. Um, in in protest, uh, there is a list of rules that police tell to pro Palestinian um, protest, including and uh, not saying anything in support of Hamas and a long list of organizations that have been criminalized in in Germany. Um, this control of of ritter, of the narrative prevents us from asking obvious questions. You have been um you've you've you're an expert on Hamas and you have uh, spoken a lot about it. So let's talking now to the German audience. How could you explain what Hamas is, why it exists? And why, if Hamas goes, another Hamas, or at least I'm assuming another Hamas will jump in? Well, first of all, I'm not an expert at all in Hamas. It's never much interested me. I, I don't I don't take an active interest in intra-party affairs. That's basically for the people among themselves to decide who are their representatives, uh, who are executors of their will, that's not for me to decide, and I don't take much interest in it. Um, as, as far as uh, Hamas is concerned, can you just restate your question? Because there were se several things you said. I, I, so basically, um, I think there's big difference between how Hamas is being viewed in Europe um, in a very um, like set it's like it's a terrorist organization it's not allowed talking about it it's not allowed and how it is viewed actually by lots of people in the Middle East they see it as a resistance movement they see it as uh, many see it as Gaza's only hope if you are to explain it to 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 Germans or Europeans um, to bring these different positions closer how could you do that I wouldn't get involved, that's the thing. It's for the people of Palestine to decide who is their, who are their representatives. If their representatives have committed crimes of such a magnitude that it's not possible morally to deal with them, uh, there is an argument obviously there. However, I don't think the argument holds up that Hama, what Hamas did on, on October 7th disqualifies it from consideration as a uh, as a participant in say a peace settlement because let's just say um, about the estimates are about 1200 uh, Israelis were killed on October 7th of those 1200 about 800 were civilians and of those 800, about 36 were children. So let's say that balance sheet, which I just went through, let's say that disqualifies Hamas. Then where does that leave Israel? Israel has been conducting a war of genocide in Gaza. It's killed about not 1,200 people, it's killed about 2,500 excuse me, 25,000 people. It's killed not 36 children, it's killed about 10,000 children. So if the acts of Hamas on October 7th disqualify it 
than the acts of Israel since October 7th, the past three months and more, must disqualify Israel from participation in any peaceful settlement of the conflict. Nobody says that. So in my opinion, it's a matter of not making a special case for Hamas or even pleading in its defense, but to simply ask the question, why aren't we applying the same standard of killing 1,200 people of whom 36 are children? If that disqualifies you from political leadership, then why doesn't killing 25,000 people of whom 10,000 are children uh, disqualify you? That's how I would approach it, not making any case for Hamas. Uh, I, I, uh, I don't think we should get involved in things like that. And plus, you'll never convince anybody. Yes, sorry, I might have uh, my my question might have come across in the wrong way. It's it's not to 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 justify an, any side of the story, but rather to explain why would anyone think that someone who uh, who 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 committed the act of or or, or did this action on seventh of October would be considered by some completely differently. Uh, I think that because there is this rhetoric in, in, the, in the Western narrative that focuses on October the 7th as the beginning of the entire event. And I, obviously, I don't agree with that. And um, I, I, as I said, uh, I don't think that's the best way of going about discussing these issues. First, I don't really, it, it, at some level, of course, it's about Hamas. But at another level, I, I don't feel it is. I, when I talk about what happened October 7th, I talk about uh, two and a half million people who have been confined in a concentration camp. I talk about the fact that most of the guys who burst the gates of Gaza on October 7th were born into that concentration camp. They'd never seen anything apart from that concentration camp. They had no past, they had no present, they had no future. Uh, just by a fluke of fate, they were born in Gaza and they weren't born in Hamburg or New York City. That's just a, a fluke of fate. And can we really hold them accountable for their actions when they were the subject, when they were immured, they were confined to a concentration camp. They were periodically subject to Israeli massacres, what Israel likes to call its operations. They were mostly unemployed, mostly couldn't stand startup families, mostly had no hope of work. Um, so I, I, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's, um, useful to focus on Hamas, whereas I think it's perfectly useful to hold, focus on Hamas militants, on those who joined. Why did they join? Uh, what kind of lives did they lead that led them to join? Because remember, October 7th was basically a suicide mission. They didn't expect to come back alive. There was a group of people who were expected to bring home the hostages bring them back to Gaza. But in general, it was a suicide mission. So why did they go on this suicide mission? What drove them to it? I think those questions are more productive and also more likely to persuade people. Um, before I move to the questions from, um, from the audience, I have a little controversial questions. I think controversial in the eyes of the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, which is your perception of uh, from the river to the sea? Mm -hmm. um, can you share with us how how you view it and why? Well, the problem is people don't understand, in my opinion, people don't understand what a political slogan is. People get this idea that a political slogan is a slogan which expresses my opinion, that it's about me. A political slogan is not about you. 
a political slogan crystallizes or synthesizes uh, in a simple words, uh, or a few words, it crystallizes or synthesizes your goal as a movement, then what's the maximum you can achieve at a political, at a particular political moment that, uh, that is a step towards achieving your ultimate goal. So let's say your ultimate goal just randomly is communism. You don't have a slogan, long live communism. That's not a political slogan. You say at this particular moment, maybe we can win the eight hour day. That was the big slogan of the workers movement for the longest time, an eight hour working day it was the eight hour day. You recognize that given your goal of achieving a communist society, that it would be a significant victory if you can achieve an eight hour working day and that that achievement was realizable that there was uh, given the state of people's consciousness the degree of organization of of workers it was a realizable goal so a political slogan takes into account many factors what's your ultimate goal what's possible at the particular moment what is the consciousness of people at a particular moment where is the uh, consciousness uh, what's the maximum you can hope to achieve at a particular political moment political slogans are very complicated if you read the history of the say the leftist the socialist movement a lot of the controversies were about political slogans which slogan, you know, Lenin, uh, Rosa Luxemburg and Lenin clashed on the slogan of the right of self-determination of nations. Uh, they're, they're, those are a very complicated business. And um, pro unfortunately, people think that political slogans are just about me. I want to show you what, how radical I am. I want to show you that I'm ready, you know, to raise the red flag of revolution uh, anywhere and everywhere. It's, I don't think that has anything to do with political slogans. Another thing about political slogan is it has to be very precise. No room, no room for doubt what you want, because uh, you need focus. You have to crystallize. I said uh, the politics of a particular moment. So let's get to this slogan: "From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free." Well, it sounds very radical. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Okay, what does it mean? Does the slogan tell you what exactly is your objective? We know eight hour day, it's very clear. An eight hour working day, it's perfectly clear what we want. Or de desegregate public schools, very clear what we want. Or Bernie Sanders, what was Bernie Sanders' platform? One, end student debt. That's very clear. We know exactly what that means. Young people are walking around with being ten, tens and tens of thousands of dollars in student debt. Free college tuition, very clear. Health care for all, absolutely clear. Nobody has any doubt what that means. It means that I can't afford to go to a hospital. I can't afford to go to a doctor. I want what Canadians have. I want what Germans have. I want what the Scandinavian countries have. have uh, Medicare, uh, healthcare for all, Medicare for all. Okay, those are very clear slogans. What, yeah. is from, what is from the river to the sea? Palestine will be free. What does it mean? I was reading uh, Syed Nasrallah's last speech, the head of the Hezbollah. And mm. guess what? In the middle of his speech, you know what he said? From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And then he said what he meant by that. He was very clear what he meant. Nasrallah doesn't play ver word games. He said, number one, he said, Israel is not a real nation. That Israel is just like a sack of potatoes. There's no sense of loyalty, no sense of, of, of uh, national identity. 
He says, real nations, they stick together in times of conflict and crisis. But he says, Israelis are not a real nation because the moment there's a crisis, everybody wants to leave. They want to go abroad. So he says, Israel is not really a nation. And then he says, every Israeli has two passports. They have an Israeli passport and a British passport. They have an Israeli passport and they have a French passport. They have an Israeli passport and you get the idea. Mm. And then he says, Palestine only belongs to the Palestinians. Let all the Jews use their double passport and go back home. That's what he said. He was very honest about it. He says, none of them belong here. They should all leave. Now, that's how he understands from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. All the Jews will leave. So you may say, that's not what I believe when I say that. But here's a problem. That is a legitimate interpretation of from the river to the sea. That's not an illegitimate interpretation. So if that's not what you mean, no. then why not come up with a slogan saying what you do mean? Why not have, you know, in, in, in apartheid South Africa, the African National Congress had a very clear slogan. It was completely unambiguous. You know what it was? One person, one vote. That was it. There was no ambiguity. We knew exactly what that meant, that every uh, person living in South Africa should have the right of citizenship in the state and should have the right to vote. One person, one vote. There was no ambiguity. Why do you choose a slogan which, in my opinion, is purposely ambiguous? Because you always have the option of coming up with a slogan which is unambiguous. Yes. But I'm so sorry for the interruption, but because uh, we want to take uh, as many questions from the audience as possible. But before I, I, I move to something else, I've I've heard this discussion before, like I've heard your, your opinion, but I also heard uh, replies. And um, I think one way to reply to it, not to create a, an argument, just to say that um, to, to, as you said, words carry meaning and these meanings could differ and many people could mean different things. And actually any good motto could be used in any way against people. So um, just to not uh, say that this, this idea is, uh, or, or your position is uh, quite common, actually uh, it's very surprisingly uncommon. Um, but I want to move on to something else. We have a question from um, our friends here. There are two questions emerging. It one in regarding to the uh, ICJ trial, and mm. we've heard um, and it says that you are you don't expect uh, that this trial or the uh, tomorrow the sentence which will be pronounced. You do not expect something would happen in relation to stopping the assault on Gaza. The question would be. If that wouldn't happen, um, how could this case, the ICG court decision, be used in a positive way, or how could it be used uh, to to mobilize larger, particularly? Oh, do you, and also, do you think that it will have any influence, if positive or negative, on um, this this Western mindset that is absolutely supportive of Israel? Well, there are many questions wrapped up in that. And I, my latest opinion is, based on the statements by Russia and China yesterday, uh, I think they got the, they need, uh, let's just, let me just give you the mechanics. There are 15 members formally on the ICJ, the International Court of Justice. However, both Israel and South Africa were entitled to add a judge uh, to the court because they weren't represented among the 15 judges. The court is based on country membership. So we say all together now there are 17 judges. Based on the statements made by Russia and China yesterday, I think they will vote in support of South Africa. And they both put a lot of emphasis on this issue of the ceasefire. 
I think it's possible. I think it's possible they're going to get the ceasefire. I think it's very tough because the main objection of Israel to the ceasefire is that it unilaterally disarms us because it's Israel that's brought to the court, which means there's no way to enforce a ceasefire on Hamas. So they call it a unilateral disarm. You know, you're unilaterally disarming us and allowing Hamas to continue to fight. And that's a, a difficult problem to get around. Now, the Chinese ambassador said yesterday at the UN, he said, of course, a ceasefire means all sides. So it's possible they're going to recommend a ceasefire on all sides, though legally they can't do that. I don't think, you know, and obviously when you there's a will, there's a way. If the court wants to, it could figure out a way. But legally, I'm not sure they can do it. So uh, in any event, there are two questions. Question number one before the court. Has South Africa made a plausible case that Israel is committing genocide? Question number two. If they have made a plausible case, what should the International Court of Justice do about this unfolding, ongoing genocide? Those are the two questions which will be answered tomorrow. I would say of the 17 votes, they will get nine votes in favor of South Africa that Israel has, excuse me, that South Africa has made a plausible case that Israel is committing genocide. They will get nine votes. I think they will not get eight votes. I do not believe they will get the United States. I do not believe they will get Australia. I do not believe they'll get France. I do not believe they will get, um, uh, I forgot the others, but you get the idea. So I think they will win that victory. But then what will the court order? And the big question is whether they will order the ceasefire. I think it's possible. But even if they don't, as my friend Muin Rabani has argued on many occasions, it will be a spectacular political victory just for Israel to be tainted with the charge of genocide. And it's a powerful weapon in the public. It means like Israel has been completely discredited on a moral level. Remember, until fairly recently, Israel was still able to say without any quarrel from anyone else, Israel is the most moral army in the world. They always say that. And they said it for decades, the most moral army in the world. Well, once the International Court of Justice says there's a plausible case of genocide, Israel has lost a lot. It's lost a lot of the high ground. So even that, I think, would be a significant victory, although its practical effect on the situation in Gaza would be limited. Um, again, now we're taking questions from uh, the audience. So one question says that you've always supported the two-state solution as the only practical one. Do you think? Uh, do you think this is still the case? What about a federal state for both uh, Palestinians and Jewish? Um, in which the Palestinian Jewish have the right to reside anywhere in the land between the river and the sea. People who reside in the West Bank live under the laws of the Palestinian state and people live outside, live under the laws of the Jewish state with the right. Uh... I've never understood these questions. I don't support anything. I have not, I, why would my personal opinion be of any relevance or significance to how to resolve the conflict. It's not a political question when you say things like that. Yeah, you, everyone, there's this tendency to so personalize the conflict. Again, it's about me. What I do is I look at the 
various political forces at play. I have a long-term goal. I would like to see, like Kant said, Immanuel Kant, a world without states, or what he called his essay on perpetual peace. That's a long-term goal, which obviously I'm not going to live to see, but I, as a, as a vision, a vision of the future, I certainly see that as a vision of the future. And then you look at what's realistically possible at the particular moment, given the political balance of forces, all those considerations I said about before, which more or less will make, maybe take us one step, one baby step towards that goal of Immanuel Kant, a world without states, okay? So that to me is the only relevant political question. And judging by the political forces, you listen to the Chinese ambassador yesterday, you listen to the Russian ambassador, all they talk about is two states. There's nothing else on the table. That's all they talk about. So the questioner says to me, what about a federal state? So, okay, fine. A federal state. Uh, do you think it's realistic any time in your lifetime or mine that Yawa Sinwar and Benjamin Netanyahu are going to work together in a federal state? Does that seem to you plausible? You see, does that seem to you possible? Is that anything uh, in the immediate near future or medium future that leads one to conclude that's a possibility. Yeah. Now, say, okay, uh, Professor Finkelstein, but you could have said the same thing to about South Africa. Uh, who would imagine that the clerk and uh, uh, Nelson Mandela would have been able to work together? Yeah, but it's a very big difference because say what you want about the ANC. The ANC had a very secular uh, 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 ecumenical vision. It, from the very beginning, it was committed to one person, one vote. It wanted a united South Africa under obviously majority rule, which would have meant black rule, but still it was committed to coexistence. Uh, that's not true of Hamas. I mean, we have to be honest. I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm just saying do you think of Hamas in terms of one person, one vote? Do you think of Hamas in terms of we want to coexist even in one state with Israel? I don't think that's really uh, uh, credible. That's why, as I said, uh, Nasrallah is at least, he's consistent and honest in his convictions. The future, he is very emphatic. He is very emphatic. Israelis do not belong, or Jews do not belong in Palestine. Take your other passport and get out of here. So I, I don't see where these vision, these slogans get us. Now you might say, and I'm perfectly willing to admit it, you might say the two-state uh, possibility is also over. Uh, given the, the 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 settlements that have been built, the um, land that's been confiscated, I'm not going to dispute that because I never quarrel with facts. I can see that argument. But then I would say, then let's just stop thinking about a vision of a solution. Right now, we should be talking about, in my opinion, uh, a ceasefire and lifting the blockade of Gaza. And then in the case of West Bank, we have to talk about ending the ethnic cleansing uh, of, uh, the, of the West Bank. And in terms of solutions, I, I don't think there's any point in discussing solutions right now. I, I, don't, I know everybody else wants to talk about solutions, including uh, all of the leading powers, as they're called, and they want to talk about the two states. I don't see it now. I, I see I see one state that wants to annihilate another state and the other state thinking I, after October 7th, you know what? Maybe we have a military option against Israel. That's the feeling among many Palestinians after October 7th that Israel turned out to be much weaker than they thought, much more vulnerable than they thought. 
And even now, three months, three months and more into the genocidal assault in Gaza, they are unable to inflict a military victory on Hamas. And so now it's been planted in the minds of many uh, Palestinians and Arabs in general that we have a military option against Israel. I don't see any anyone seriously, uh, any of the actors, any of the key actors, I don't see any of them seriously talking about a quote unquote political solution. I see from now uh, forward, it's gonna be a very, um, it's gonna be very brutal and bloody because neither one side believes in order to restore what they call the deterrence capacity, the Arab world fear of them, they have got to destroy Hamas. And also, by the way, after Hamas, they have to destroy the Hezbollah. And the other side believes that they they um, they can maybe militarily defeat Israel. So that's not the soil on which you're going to have a peaceful settlement of the conflict. I'm sorry, people, you know, if I'm the bearer of bad news, but I think that's what honesty shows. When I saw uh, Nisrallah's last statement, uh, yeah. I thought, nope, this is not going to work. I mean, not going to work in the sense, uh, let's stop talking about two states, forget about one state. And we're at a a point where it's it's a, a military battlefield. Okay. Now, you always are saying lots of statements that really require lots of comments and breaking. But I think when it comes to that question, when they say you you wanted or you supported, I think what they refer to is as a your analysis was in that side. It wasn't literally just to say that was that's your opinion. And I think um, while your response was a little bleak that we should not look at long term, um, it is hard for people to hear it because it, it's hard to look at the situation in Palestine and think we only have the option uh, to to look at short term um, targets. While, while I understand your perception and I understand that you're putting lots of facts in front of you for you to come up with with this statement it's still kind of not easy to absorb and not try to find somehow an alternative between a one state or two state solutions I think people you know because a lot of people like philosophy seminars they, they find these daily these daily questions, questions of daily life, they find them unexciting. You know, a large part of the history of the left was just winning struggles on things like reducing the working day. They weren't about fighting for communism and all of that. It was just trying to improve the lives of ordinary people in the ordinary here and now. Of course, you, you maintain in your heart and also in your mind that ultimate vision. But on a daily level, you're fighting the most, you know, you're fighting an eviction from your home. You know how many worker struggles were just about rent strikes? Yeah. Rent strikes, fighting evictions, trying to win an eight, you know, reduce the working day, trying to get health care. That was a lot, that's what a lot of the struggles. They weren't sitting around talking about the dictatorship of the proletariat. They weren't. They were talking about daily crises and how to achieve victories. So from my point of view, if you can lift that blockade of Gaza, which has been in place for three decades now, that's just a huge victory. That's a huge victory. And Instead of talking about things like a federal state, federal state, I mean, 60% of Israelis think that Israel is not using enough force in Gaza. Which brings me to the next question from the audience um, involved uh, Israeli. So, Dr. Pinkelstein, you mentioned Israel being considered Aryan. 
by non-Jewish European Zionists. Do you think these Zionists believe in a Jewish supremacy outside of Israel? Do you think their idea of Jews being a category of Aryans also is one of the reasons why Germans support Israel unconditionally? Jewish, su Jewish supremacy as a placeholder of Aryanism, since Aryanism has been cancelled and criminalized in Europe, so the only way to practice the Uber mention uh, worldview is though Zionism because that's legal. I think that's way too complicated. You know, it, it, uh, first of all, I, I, I wrote my doctoral dissertation on, on Zionism, was on the theory of Zionism. It was called A Theory of Zionism. Uh, and I'm the first one to say it's an utterly useless concept that doesn't get us very far. I think the best formulation, I don't particularly go for the apartheid uh, formulation either, because apartheid was over in 1989. Most people haven't a clue what apartheid means. They have no clue what it was like in action. Uh, it, it's, it's a preoccupation of, of uh, jurists because there is the crime of apartheid, both the genocide, uh, there's a crime of apartheid as a legal category. It exists as a legal category. But for most people, what is apartheid? Well, it has the word apart in it. So it seems to mean something about segregation or apartness, and that's no good. But otherwise, I don't think apartheid is very good. I, I thought that the Israeli Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories, Israeli Information Center, it's called Beth Selim. Uh, I thought its formulation was the best, in my opinion. There's one state now between the Mediterranean and the Jordan, Israel, uh, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, Gaza, and the, the state of Israel have all become one state. There's, Israel controls everything from in that one state. And they said that the state is based on the principle of Jewish supremacy. And I think that's an accurate description. I wouldn't call it a Zionist state because I don't think Zionist has much content uh, to it. But Jewish supremacist has content. It means that in that state, if you're a Jew, you enjoy some privileges and super privileges that if you're not Jewish, you don't enjoy. That's what Jewish supremacy means. Uh, exactly what kinds of privileges? Well, obviously it differs. In, in Gaza and the West Bank, they don't enjoy any right to vote. Whereas uh, Palestinians in the state of Israel, they do have the right to vote and they have the right to membership and uh, representation in the Knesset, even on the Supreme Court. But even with those rights, it's still a Jewish supremacist state for um, Palestinians in Israel. So I, I thought that's a, a, it's a good formulation, which captures the essence. I don't see why I have to drag in Zionism. I, I, it just, it's Zionism is like from the river to the sea. You know, my, one of my closest friends for 40 years was Noam Chomsky and Professor Chomsky described himself as a Zionist. So what does Chomsky have in common with Smoltrich? Not very much, but they both call themselves Zionists. So I don't think it's just very useful as a political category. We just don't have to go there, you know? We don't have to get into an argument about what does Zionism mean? It's a very simple question you can put to people. Do you believe, do you support a state where by virtue of the fact that you're Jewish, you gain certain privileges that non-Jews don't get? Do you, do you think that's a right setup? That if you're Jewish, you should get certain legal privileges that non-Jews don't get. And then you can have a substantive conversation. Um, so a follow-up question also from our people on, on this matter, which is what are some aspects of the conflict that people are not focusing on that they should be? And what is, in your opinion, uh, what, in your opinion, is being given too much significance? Well, I think the most important aspect of the conflict is there are two right now. 
there is, well, three actually. The most immediate, of course, is the ceasefire because mass famine is threatening. And um, uh, so long as there's no ceasefire, the goods that get to Gaza, they can't be distributed because Israel's bombing everywhere. There are two problems with the, the humanitarian aid. Problem number one, outside Gaza, Israel has created this hopelessly complicated bureaucratic uh, mechanism so as to prevent humanitarian aid from getting into Gaza. There are three layers of three layers of searches that you have to go through before you can even get food, food, medicine, water into Gaza. And then once you get into Gaza, you can't distribute it because Israel's bombing everywhere. So, uh, and as a result, the, uh, the guess is within a month, there's going to be mass famine. And that's a very serious issue, you know. Uh, in the case of Yemen, between the years 1915 and 18, there was a Saudi blockade of Yemen, like the Israeli blockade of Gaza. And between uh, 2015 and 2018, uh, 80,000 uh, Yemenis died, of whom 60% were died of starvation. 80,000, so we're talking about, about 50,000 people died of starvation. So when we talk, uh, when you talk about uh, mass famine and is imminent, that's a very serious issue. Uh, so the first thing is the ceasefire, otherwise there's gonna be mass famine within a month. Second is lifting the blockade, because uh, the blockade is, uh, it's a, a minimum a war crime, but uh, a credible argument can be made that it constitutes a crime against humanity, the blockade. And the third thing is that uh, there's a very real possibility that if a war breaks out, and that's certainly not off the table, uh, a war with Hezbollah, which then involves Iran, then involves the Houthis, um, that if a war breaks out, Israel will use it as an excuse to ethnically cleanse the West Bank. So the uh, stop ethnic stop the ethnic cleansing of the West Bank has to be also a crucial component of any immediate strategy. I'll take one more question because I'm dying. I, I need I need to go to sleep because I think I'm going to collapse. Um, I'm, yes, I'm going to be Gaza's last victim. <laughs> I've heard I've heard you said this, but we hope not. Certainly not on, in our hands. Um, so I I want to go back to to us to to people who are active in this context. I I want to uh, combine a few questions together, but also ask you our own uh, question. Um, in terms of this, the future of this movement. So some people asked if you're connected with any academic in German academia, um, but, and hopefully if, if you are, maybe that would feed in, into this question. So since our goal is to achieve, um, now I'm scared to tell you what our goals are, but let's say one of- You can have any goal you want. Yeah, no, no, I'm saying uh, we want to have, better freedom of expression and speech in German academia. What is your opinion, in your opinion, are effective ways of encouraging German academic institutions to deviate from the official government position and allow for critical discourse on uh, Palestine, Israel? And um, how effective, for example, are the academic boycotts and pressure from academics globally? Also, bearing in mind or understanding how the memory of the Holocaust has been weaponized by Israel and other states like Germany, how should we organize the politics of memory in the future? And how can we process collectively traumatic events like the Holocaust and uh, the genocide in Gaza and, and for the future, the, the genocide in Gaza? Honestly, I can't answer that question. I think those are difficult questions. I, I, I don't think it's good for political groups to become uh, talking shops. But on the other hand, I do think you need clarity before you press ahead, because these issues are, uh, they are complicated. There are no obvious answers. And I think what you need to do is, without becoming a talking shop, uh, I do think you should uh, try to assemble 
a group of uh, a body of writings, uh, have speakers come, and then put your minds to try to figure out how you navigate these waters. I think they're tough. And, but I also think that unless you figure out a way forward, you're not going to make much progress in Germany. You're not going to make much progress in Germany. Uh, I do think at the university level, you should stress uh, going back to the classical German thinkers, uh, uh, stress the importance of freedom of speech. And that there should be a very limited, very limited constraints on freedom of speech. And the current constraints that are being imposed are completely unacceptable. They're a breach of basic principles of freedom of speech and they're wholly unjustified. And you cannot use the claim of historic memory and historic moral responsibility to silence speech. I don't accept that. I mean, I don't want to speak for myself, but I think that you can make an argument that's unacceptable. Um, trust on, on the university level, I would focus on the issue of freedom of speech and go through the classical tradition, go through Mills on Liberty, John Stuart Mills on Liberty, see how he formulates the question, how he formulates the answers, and try to come up with a platform of your own on the university uh, on the basis of classical principles, which can't be violated in the name of a special historic memory. No, you can't do that. Uh, yes, you have, so you, you can say you have special responsibilities, but you know, you take the case of the United States. So we have a special historic responsibility of slavery, okay? And what came after slavery, uh, the Jim, what was called the Jim Crow, the system. Uh, professors are allowed to teach that black people have lower IQs than white people. They're allowed to teach it. You can have that historic responsibility, but still you have that right to teach it. And I think that's correct. If you don't like what those professors are saying, then you answer them. But I don't accept the argument of silencing them. And I think the same thing should be in Germany. You could say in the German professors, if in American universities, you can teach that white people have higher IQs than black people, even though they have a history of slavery. Why can't we talk about certain subjects here? Why are we limited here? That's not right. You can both have a historic responsibility. You can have a historic moral responsibility and still maintain a maximum of free speech. And that's if you saw yesterday, Columbia University, uh, the professors now are organizing against the billionaire class, which is trying to uh, stifle, suppress free speech. And that's what they're doing. They're saying, you are destroying the whole idea of a university. You are not allowing people to have free, full and fearless exchange of opinions. And so when they are attacking those who are trying to deprive them of the right to support Palestinians, they're beginning with, their foundation is the basic principles of free speech. And those basic principles cannot be abandoned or set aside because of this thing called historic memory and historic moral responsibility. No, you can do both. You can both honor the memory, respect the memory, accept your responsibility, and say, but when it comes to speech, you can't restrict it. You can do both. And I think that's the approach that the Columbia professors are now taking. And that's always been my belief. That's the way to go forward. Because we have truth on our side. When I say we, we who uh, support a fairly, a deeply rude historic uh, tradition on the left, 
we have truth on our side, and so we um, shouldn't fear free speech. Because the, uh, my belief is that what I believe is true, and that in the course of free speech, I can persuade people of the truthness of my beliefs. So I think um, that's what should be done. You should frame it in terms of elementary principles of free speech are being violated here, and that you cannot violate those principles in the name of historic memory, because even in the United States, which has the memory of the extermination of native population and the enslavement of the African population, there's no restrictions that you can put on a professor's right to teach or say what he or she wants. Well, um, this is, so we, we will bear that in mind, definitely, especially that it's coming from you, Professor, because you yourself have suffered a lot for from the restrictions in the academia. Um, so we cherish this advice and we'll try to keep it in mind. Hopefully they will listen to us or we'll be able to apply it. Unfortunately, you cannot imagine how many questions we received. So I would like to apologize from the audience uh, for not being able to take all your questions. Um, I would like to also thank you so much, Professor. I know you had a long day. We have uh, we already talked so early in the morning, so I can imagine it's been such a long day, but it has been a pleasure. Who knows, maybe we talk again. Uh, a little bit less stressful day for you. Um, That's fine. I just want to reiterate at the end, I don't think it's an easy challenge in Germany. I get that because of the conflation of a real issue, which is there is a historical memory, there is a historical responsibility with a totally fake issue, which is manipulating a Nazi Holocaust for very evil political purposes, very evil political purposes. And how do you separate out the two and say, this is legitimate, but this is not legitimate. Uh, this I respect, this I condemn. Very hard, very hard. That's why I think, you know, you folks have to sit down, you should read, you should listen, you should, interrogate, you shouldn't be passive listeners, and maybe set yourself a goal six months from now, or at the beginning of the new uh, uh, semester, next, in, uh, next uh, after summer break, you'll have, a settle, you'll have a statement. Set yourself that goal, you'll listen for two or three months, then you will produce draft statements among yourselves. You circulate the draft statements, criticize them and so forth, and then set your goal by, I don't know if your school term begins in September or October, but you set the goal by September, October, we have our statement. Uh, I think that's a good agenda. Now, now let me uh, assure you that we already had so many statements, including one about today, but I, we see your point. We understand that this is a long process. It's going to be tiring. We had, there is a long way in front of us and uh, we will keep you posted on how it goes, hopefully. But again, maybe, maybe next time we meet, we will have uh, a whole plan to, to discuss, or we might have reached uh, a milestone. Um, with this note, Professor, I thank you so much for being with us here today. I, we really appreciate it. I also would like to thank everyone who attended with us online. Those um, in Mosaic Center. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being there. Um, thank you for Mosaic Center for hosting and um, for response team for hosting also online with us. And most importantly, uh, I would like to Thank my colleague in the lecture series from both uh, Students Collective Berlin and from Decolonial uh, Research Group, DeCoco. Um, we've been trying hard to make this lecture series working and we have kicked, kicked it off with lots of um, lectures. So we invite everyone to, to follow and stay tuned for upcoming lectures. I renew my thanks 
to you all and we wish you a great day. Uh, Professor Norman, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome.